Well, it is good to see you uh, this morning on a, uh, what begins a Labor Day weekend, really, tomorrow. Uh, it's, it's interesting. We have this national holiday, so working people and working class people get uh, a day off to recognize them, and it is often the working class people who don't get the day off. That's certainly true in the service sector across our nation. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6 this morning. Ephesians chapter 6. If you want to make your way there in your Bible or on your mobile device or you can follow along on the screen when we get there. Um, the, the holiday that we celebrate tomorrow as a nation was enacted as a law by Congress in 1894, a hundred years before I graduated high school. And then Glover Cleveland, Grover Cleveland, interesting name, Grover Cleveland, he was a president, for those of you that don't know, a long time ago. Grover Cleveland signed it into law on June 28th of that year, and it became a national holiday that we have celebrated ever since. Uh, and it's interesting, the church has not always had a, a real good relationship, nor uh, a robust theology around work, around work. Uh, some reformers after uh, the Protestant Reformation have, have uh, developed some of that. And just lately, over the last 10 or 15 years, I know I'm very much indebted to guys like Tim Keller and the, uh, the Gospel and Work, Faith and Work Center at Redeemer Presbyterian Church in Manhattan um, and others who've sought to look again at what Scripture says about the relationship between the Gospel and our lives in Christ and our vocation. So that's, uh, that's our run this morning at what, uh, what does kingdom-focused vocation in the world look like and how does that speak to uh, our need and our creation uh, in and for purpose. Dorothy Sayers, some of you may be familiar with, I know many of you will not, was a, a mid-20th century uh, novelist, playwright, poet. She was an English uh, woman and she was also a really brilliant theological thinker and writer and she wrote a lot um, and talked a lot about this, uh, this connection, this intersection where uh, the church and vocation or work meet. And she wrote a, a now pretty famous article called Work, Why Do It? Um, that she delivered as an address at Villanova University here in the United States in 1942. And I want to read you a section from this article written by Sayers, Work, Why Do It, and particularly point out to you the last line in it. So let's listen to Sayers now. This won't be up on the screen. Um, you just get to listen to me most of this morning. In nothing, in nothing has the church so lost her way on reality as in her failure to understand and respect the so-called secular vocation. The church has allowed work and religion to become separate departments. And therefore, the church is astonished that work in God's world has turned to purely selfish and destructive ends. And also is astonished that many have become uninterested in faith. Now listen to this. How can anyone remain interested in a religion or faith which has no concern for nine-tenths of his or her life? It's a very valid question, is it not? It is. We spend the vast majority of our lives at work. And it is not true at all that the Bible and the gospel does not have an immense amount to say about our vocation and our life in our vocation, although we've not often addressed it. But it is so important because Sayers is absolutely right. And in our day, in, in a post-Christian West, where people are not asking, oh my gosh, what's going to happen to me after I die? Like was the common question around the World War I and World War II in the early mid-20th century. Uh, and out of that came a model of evangelism that worked right then. But now people are asking, hey, what makes sense of this mess of a world? What makes sense of my work life and speaks into my work life and meaning day in and day out? And if we don't know that, not only do we miss out on a sense of our own purpose, and who we are in God Monday through Friday or whatever your work schedule looks like throughout the week. But we also miss out on an opportunity to connect with those around us and to help them understand the gospel is good news for their life at work. Which as Sayer says may not be nine tenths of life but it's a whole lot of life. Let's look at a, a passage in Ephesians 6 from the Apostle Paul. 
beginning in verse 5. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey, obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven. And there is no favoritism with him. Now, we have to do a little background on this passage real quick to understand it as 21st century Americans and how it speaks to our life as men and women at work in God's world throughout much of our life. If you look at this, Paul is just writing a household code here. Many of you know that, some of you don't yet. But household codes were very common in that day. Uh, Greek and Roman writers would write household codes in everything they wrote. And it was just a way of saying hey, a household in that day included husband and wife, uh, parents and children, and household servants or slaves. That's what comprised the household. And so they would write these codes always as they wrote, saying, hey, this is how um, husband and wife deal with one another. This is how uh, parents deal with children and children with parents. And this is how masters and slaves deal with one another. So, so Paul is dipping into this because he's sending a letter to the church in Ephesus, which met where? In homes. The church met in homes. So Paul is addressing this, and it if you're a thinker, it begs the question, why didn't, why didn't Paul, since, since most of us are aware that Christians led the movement to abolish slavery and the slave trade in England and the United States, led primarily by Quakers and evangelical Christians, if that took place, why didn't Paul call for the abolishment of the institution of slavery here? Well, let me say this first of all. Primarily because it was a very, very different institution than the one that forms our worldview around that word. Right? Slaves in Paul's day, uh, slavery was not race-based. There were slaves of all colors, ethnicities, and creeds. Sla uh, slavery was not based on, on kidnapping people and selling them. It was based on, on victory and loss in combat and in battles. And if you lost... Uh, you were taken into slavery largely, and it was indentured servitude. It was a way of working off debt that you could not pay. It also was not lifelong. It wasn't indefinite. Slavery was typically around 10 to 15 years that you were enslaved to a master, either because uh, your people had lost a battle or a war, or because you were an indentured servant. You couldn't pay your debt, uh, or somebody in your family couldn't pay your debt, was allowing you uh, in their good pleasure to work it off. For them. Um, that was the nature. Slaves had rights in Paul's day. They had rights. They owned property. They could actually own slaves and servants themselves. Slaves in the Greco Roman world could take their masters to court if they felt like the relationship was an unjust one, that they were being treated unduly harshly. Now, it like it wasn't it still wasn't a birthday party, right? Make no mistake about it. It's not how God designed human beings to flourish and thrive, but it was not at all the system you and I think about and modern Westerners think about when we hear the word slave or slavery. Paul's not condoning the institution of slavery here. Uh, truthfully, he's really not addressing it at all. Um, what he's, he's doing, instead of giving an opinion on the first century Greco-Roman institute of slavery, is he simply saying to Christians gathering on a Sunday morning in first century Ephesus, hey, people of God, this is how you live when you go back to work tomorrow. When you get up Monday morning, this is how you're to go about your day in the world in which we live. And yet, and yet, the very writings of Paul, much less the entirety of Scripture, create this environment that assured the death of slavery eventually. 20th century New Testament scholar F.F. F. Bruce said this, Paul creates an atmosphere in his letters where the institution of slavery could only wilt 
and die. The attitudes that the gospel creates in Christians means that the institution of slavery could not live within the church. Paul sets it up to fail. And that's very, very true. So it's important to remember that, um, that Paul's not calling for the, for the abolishment of the institution of slavery here because he's not dealing with the institution of slavery in his world. It's a very different thing than you and I think about. He's simply saying, this is how you're to live. When you get up and go about your business tomorrow. He had already said that to husbands and wives. He'd said that to parents and kids. And now he's addressing slaves and masters. But there's another background question quickly that we have to deal with. And it's simply this. Okay, if it's a very different institution still, um, what, what is the connection between first century Greco-Roman slaves and 21st century workers in the Western world? Well, I don't know if you have noticed, but work is still, is still grinding drudgery, humiliating, and exhausting for all people some of the time, and for some people all of the time. I mean, how many of us in here would not say we have been utterly exhausted and defeated at times by our work? That is still the nature of work in a broken world. It's hard. It's very hard. We know that. We know that work is often about overwork or it's about overmanagement. It's about being worried and not making enough money even though you're working all you can. And the early church was filled with slaves and servants because, because the gospel gave them something. It gave them a new worldview, a new understanding of who God was and who they were and the world that led to a more meaningful view and experience of their work, even as slaves and servants. Does that make sense? Now, with that background stuff out um, of the way, I want to just point out a, a couple of things, make two observations this morning that I think come from the text here with regard to kingdom-focused vocation in the world. And I think we desperately need that. Church, we should go about our work differently than our unbelieving counterparts do. We have a different power, a different way of understanding it, or we should. Here's the first observation. All work is a calling from God and should be done for his glory. All work is a calling from God and should be done for his glory glory what's interesting here let's go back and look at these verses again verse 5 verse 5 slaves obey your earthly masters we'll do a little bit more with that in a minute with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart just as you would obey christ paul says now that's a really powerful statement with the same attitude and heart with which you would obey your redeemer and lord you are to treat your master or your boss with that same level of respect and attitude as you go about your work. And we can all agree that we've worked for some bosses that would make that a point of our own sanctification. Have we not? We're like, but, but God, my boss is an idiot. Well, maybe so, but Jesus died for you, right? And that's the level playing field he leaves us. Verse 6, obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you. And we're like, we, most of us have been there, right? You're standing around, you're chit-chatting, and somebody comes by in authority, and all of a sudden everybody's working or they're locked on. Good morning, sir. Good morning, ma'am. Once they're out of range, you go back, eating your Kit Kats or whatever. Not only to earn their favor when they're watching, but as slaves of Christ... See what Paul did there? But as slaves of Christ, men and women called into the service of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. This is powerful. Paul's beginning to link here your vocation in the world with the will of God. And he doesn't distinguish. He doesn't say, well, this is, this is true for people that do this work, but not this work. He's saying if God has placed you in a domain of life where you're working, you are to understand that work as part of God's will for his world and for your life. Verse 7, serve wholeheartedly 
And the English says, as if you were serving the Lord. As if you were it is not in there in the original language. It's just, but it doesn't read near as well. Serve wholeheartedly as serving the Lord. As serving the Lord. What Paul is saying is that when you go about your work in the place that God has, has put you in life, you are ultimately serving the Lord in that work. It is his world. All work is a calling from God and should be done for his glory. He says that we do this because we know in verse 8 that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. Grace does not negate the reward language and teaching of the New Testament. Right? Grace simply says we cannot earn through our effort the redemptive favor of God. We can't make God feel differently about us because of what we do. And yet Paul says that when we work for the Lord in what we do, that part of why we do that is because we know that God is just and right and good. He sees us and he will reward us in time, slave or free for the work that we've done. Now, this is a very different attitude. I said to you earlier that that all Greek and Roman writers in the day, we have many, many, many examples of this, um, wrote household codes. But none of them that we've ever found so far addressed slaves. You didn't need to address slaves. You just addressed masters, right? Because slaves just did what they were told. And Paul, through the gospel of Jesus Christ, flips this upside down. And all of a sudden, slaves are elevated to the same level as masters. And this went against the day. Seneca said, always treat your slaves as, as enemies, that that great early thinker and philosopher. He was saying, that's all slaves understand, is, is this kind of work-master relationship. Aristotle actually said some people were born to be slaves. Aristotle believed some people were just, they were just created for that role. And Paul says, no way. Everything and everyone belongs to God. I once had a long conversation with a, a Christian bartender when we lived in Southern California, and he talked about how he approached his job as a follower of Jesus, both in terms of when he cut people off, when he had decided they'd have a, had enough for the night, but also in terms of how he, he listened. And he talked about engaging in the ministry of listening and counseling as a bartender, because every night that he worked, his bar, his place of work was filled with men and women who were broken and in need. And many, many of them had no one listening to them. Right? So whatever it is, Paul is saying everything and everyone belongs to God. There's inherent dignity in all people and all work. Now, this, this grabbed a hold of Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer. Luther was a Catholic monk who set out to reform the Catholic Church and ended up um, being the catalyst for the launch of, of Protestantism. But what Luther had been told all his life, and some of you have been told, is, hey, uh, being a monk, being a priest, or something like that, that is a, like a, a divine calling and something special before God. And everything else is just, it's just meaningless work. And Luther runs across this as he's studying and actually teaching Ephesians, and it completely explodes his view of that. And he realizes that's absolutely wrong. That's absolutely wrong, which led to a few of his, his most famous phrases. One of them, uh, he said, the milkmaid has as honorable, as honorable a calling as the priest and the preacher. The milkmaid has as honorable a calling as the priest and the preacher. And this rose up out of one of the doctrines of the Reformation, the priesthood of the believer. That men and women are made in God's image and they represent him in a kind of priestly ministry to his creation and world in all the domains of life. Wherever you are and whatever you are doing. Luther also said this famously, and I, I love this, listen. The Christian shoemaker, the Christian shoemaker does his duty not by putting little crosses on the shoes, but by making good shoes because God is interested in good craftsmanship. Dorothy Sayers that I mentioned at the beginning 
Um, further down in that talk that she gave, that article, Work, Why Do It, she says this, the church's approach to an intelligent carpenter, and plug in what, whatever you are here, but the church's approach to an intelligent carpenter is usually confined to exhorting him not to be drunk and disorderly during his off time and to come to church on Sundays. Got to watch carpenters. What the church should be telling him is this. The very first demand that his faith makes upon him is that he should make good tables. That there's honor and dignity and God-given calling in the work itself. All work matters. And it's necessary for human thriving and for the care of God's good creation. It's a calling from God. Listen to this. Like, if you don't clean your house, if you don't clean your if you don't clean your bathrooms and you don't clean your kitchen countertops and you don't clean your refrigerator or you don't pay someone to do it from time to time, eventually you're going to get sick and die. It's not fun, but it has to be done. I was talking with one of my offspring yesterday, and they were having to load dishes into the dishwasher. And this particular child said, I don't know why I have to do this. I don't like doing this. And then this particular child said, no one likes doing this. And I said, you're absolutely right. No one likes doing it, but it has to be done. None of us mind dirtying up the dishes, right? It has to be done. This work around the house matters. And if someone didn't take care of the trash and handle the sewage, and handle the water issues in a community, the entire community, and eventually the society would break down, people would get sick and die. All work matters. It's not all equally fulfilling. It's not all uh, equally uh, lucrative in terms of pay or equally respected, but it should be equally respected within the church. It should be equally respected among the people of God who have a theology of work that informs how we think about vocation in God's world. And this is God's world. He made this material world. And he made the human community within it. And he gave us different abilities and different interests and different capacities so that our work might be beneficial to God's creation and glorifying to the God of creation. And when you think this way, when, when you look at what Paul's writing here and, and you begin to tell yourself over and over, all work is a calling from God and it should be done for his glory, you begin to do your work differently. You really do. And you begin to treat people differently within the sphere of your work or even people that you run into throughout your day as you're enjoying services that are a benefit of their work. R.C. Sproul, uh, well-known uh, minister and theologian in the United States, was writing a book on this topic. And he happened to be in the hospital for a little while. He was visiting some people. And, and he was looking around, and, and he noticed um, there's a caste system in, in the hospital. And he watched this for quite a while. He was astounded because he was already thinking about this. As he was there over several days, he said, there's clearly a pecking order in a hospital. There are the star doctors. And surgeons, and then there are the doctors, and then there are the residents, and then there are the nurses, and then there are the aides and the techs, and then there are the administrative workers, and then there's housekeeping. And he said he was sitting in the hall one day, and he uh, saw a, a, a nurse speaking with a group of doctors, and she was very attentive and upbeat and happy and, um, and was taking care of business and getting what she needed to do. Um, and the doctors walked off and Sproul said he just happened to be sitting there, and she walked by him. And as she was coming, a man got off the elevator coming from housekeeping, uh, pushing a thing. And he said he seemed to be in a pretty good mood, was smiling and happy. And as he got close to the nurse, he greeted her, and she just put her eyes down and went past him. Now, I'm not picking on the medical community. Any kind of big uh, institution or environment, universities operate this way. There's always a pecking order. And Sproul said he remembered thinking, this is America. We don't have caste systems here. But the caste system isn't is a product of the human heart. We don't need someone to tell us and enforce the fact that we're better than some people and some people are better than us. That's what we naturally believe in our brokenness and our sinfulness. That's what we believe. 
But a real theology around work destroys that. It says you are no better vocationally than anybody else. You're no better in any way than anyone else. All work is a calling from God and should be done for his glory. As serving the Lord, Paul says. It changes everything. Second observation I would make is this. Your boss is only your boss, not your Lord. And if you're a boss, I would say this to you. You are only people's boss. You are not their Lord. You have the same Lord they have. Your boss is only your boss, not your Lord. And here's what this does. Let me, um, let me unpack this a little bit. When we understand this and we look at Paul's teaching right here, and I'll pull it out in just a second, it frees us both from overwork and underwork. It puts vocation and labor in the appropriate place in our lives. There's kind of a firms versus factory sort of mindset. What I mean is white collar and, and, and blue collar. In the white collar world, overwork is the issue. Rush and push and climb. Your vocation is your life. It's your sense of identity. You've got to succeed. You've got to win. In the blue collar world, underwork is the problem. Most blue collar workers don't typically love their jobs. They're not in to go there every day some of them are but but culturally they are not most of them do not like their management and they'll look for any opportunity to kind of uh, kick back and slack off so e each each dimension has their own issues I remember hearing Tim Keller tell a story one time of being uh, off for summer from graduate school and he was working in a factory in the northeast that summer as a grad student and he said uh, about three or four days in one of the older guys to him, came to him and said, son, you've got to stop this. You've got to slow down. Uh, if you give our supervisors the impression that you can do this much work every day, they're going to expect the rest of us to do that for the next 30 years. So you have to slow down because you're going to leave here in about 10 weeks. And we'll stay here. And Keller said, you know, as a young 24-year-old who knows everything, I thought, how dare he? You know, so lazy. This is all that's wrong with this country. Um, he said, looking back now, I realized he was absolutely right. He was saying, listen, kid, we're going to stand on this line and do this thing for 30 or 40 years. So we're not in any big rush about it. I remember working for a, an old field and land company my high school, uh, my senior year in high school, my freshman year in college when I would come back. And I remember when I started working there, I was, I was raised in, in a very kind of blue-collar, working-class family. Um, and, and work and worth ec ethic were very, very, very high on my mom and dad's list of, of values. And so I went to work, and, and I worked. And it wasn't long in until some of the guys who'd been working there for years and worked there years after I quit were like, slow down, Jeffries, what are you in such a hurry for? They'd work, and they'd rest about equal parts throughout the day. And, uh, and the mantra would kind of be like, slow, slow, slow down, college boy. You know, you're not going to earn a degree here. Just relax. It's very, very true because in the white-collar world, the problem is overwork. And in the blue-collar world, the problem is underwork. In the white-collar world, if you're not overworking, you kind of have this fear that you're not going to be noticed or you may be cut because it doesn't look like your job is your whole life. Well, it, it may be news to us, but our jobs aren't our whole life, or they shouldn't be. And Paul comes along and he says, you're not ultimately working for your boss, but for the Lord. You're not ultimately working for your boss, but for the Lord. Look at this uh, in verse 5. Let's go back and look at verse 5 again. Slaves, obey your earthly masters. Other household codes would just say, obey your masters. Paul puts a, a clarifying statement, a definer here. He says, they're just your earthly master. They are not your ultimate master and Lord. And look what he says to masters in verse 9. Hey, don't treat your slaves, or he says, do treat your slaves in the same way. If you look at in the same way, it's a modifier. Go back up to verse 5 that we just read. Obey your earthly masters with what? With fear and respect, respect and fear, with sincerity of heart. We'll deal with that word fear here in a minute. It's not so much to be afraid of, but to have appropriate appreciation for their position in your life. And he tells the masters to treat their slaves in the same way. Now, he's talking to all of us as followers as Christ. 
And what he's saying is, whatever institutions or structures we live in, within our society, we live in them differently than the rest of the world. Uh, that that the, 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 uh, the ground at the foot of the cross truly is level. It has to be. Because you're absolutely every bit as broken and dependent on God's grace as whoever else around you is. Maybe more sometimes. Who knows? So, so this understanding of work and who we are before God, it destroys overwork. It destroys overwork. Because it lets me know that even if I'm not being noticed, even if I'm not being promoted or being successful like I feel like I should and I want, what Paul says is God sees. God sees the work you're doing. Verse 8. And he's the one you're ultimately working for, verses 8 and 9. Serve your masters, serve your bosses, serve your job, your vocation, as you serve the Lord. As serving the Lord. And he will reward you in due time. Give it your best, give it your all, but that's it, right? That's it. God is the only master in the world that gives life instead of taking it. If you make your career your master and you fail at it, it will absolutely destroy you. Anything else in your life that you make your master, if it goes sideways or wrong, it will absolutely destroy you. But understanding this also destroys underwork. It says to us that our real supervisor, our real boss is the Lord, and he's always watching. He sees, and he's just good and right. And we want to put our heart and our work because we're doing it for him. Right? We're doing it for him. Whatever your work is, you're doing it for him. Now, let me, some of you this morning at, or watching online, whether you're in here or you're online, have tension building in you. And I want to release that. You've got tension building in you because you don't, you don't work right now. Maybe you're done with vocational work in your life. Or maybe you're a student in here. Can I just say, if you're a student in here, school is your vocational place right now. It's where God has placed you. And you do, do you understand how differently it would be to approach algebra or chemistry or history or literature and sit down and say, God, help me understand this as a way of better understanding you and better understanding your world and how life is? God, help me as I memorize. Help me as I struggle to, to, to learn. God, let me do this for your glory. Let me do the best I can while knowing my identity is not wrapped up in this. It's not wrapped up in what grade I make. I'm doing this ultimately for you. You may be a stay-at-home mom or dad. You may be caring for kids and a home full-time. That is honorable, important, crucial work in a society if a society is going to thrive. How you bring this teaching into your home, the way that you serve your kids, because as parents, as adults, you're master over your kids. But you're not to lord it over them. You're to treat them with dignity and respect and honor and to lay your life down for them as the Lord has done for you. Maybe you're home caring for a spouse. That's the season of life you're in. The way that you do that, it matters to God. It is a calling in your season of life right now. And God will give you what you need to do that. Daily and only daily, this is how God supplies our needs. I don't need God's supply for tomorrow yet. Right? It's not here. But he will give me what I need today. Maybe it's just you. Maybe you're a widow or a widower and it's just you at home or maybe just you with a room or an apartment somewhere. But how you care for yourself, how you relate to friends that you still have to your church, how you care for whatever your physical space is, is a sense, is a type of vocational calling in the stage of life that you're in. And God is a gracious master, says, do it for my glory. Do it for me because I am good and just and right. Let me read Ephesians 5, 21. 
everything that we've looked at this morning and everything that preceded it, um, even beyond chapter 6, is clothed in this. Submit to one another. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This word reverence here is literally fear, but it doesn't mean to be afraid. It means joyful, astonished, awe, and wonder before God. Do everything that you do. Submit to one another mutually. Out of reverence for God, out of joyful, astonished, awe and wonder before God. Slaves, serve your masters. Masters, serve your slaves. Out of joyful wonder for how Christ has served you. That he walked to the cross and he gave his life for you. Nobody else could do that. None of us ultimately can give our lives for anyone because our lives are going to end anyway. Jesus is the only one who's ever lived who could truly lay his life down for another because his life had no, no cap on it. I pray that you can think on these things this week. And I pray that God's Spirit would stir your heart and mind as you think about your purpose in creation, the care and work that God's given you. Let's stand and pray. Thank you, God, that you not only created all that is in your good world, God, but you created us to participate in your care of your world and in the ongoing work and creation of your world. God, you gave us a garden, but you never, you never intended it to stay there. God, you planted in the hearts of human beings the desire and the ability as people made in your image to create and build God, to renew and fix and repair, to teach and enforce and listen, to make whole and heal. God, wherever we are this morning, wherever we find ourselves vocationally, I pray, God, in your mercy that you would give us a kingdom focus, change the way that we understand going to work, change the way that we understand wherever we are in this season of life, Father. And I pray that the result of that would be greater joy, greater vitality, and human thriving among your people, God, that we might shine as lights in a dark world for your glory. I pray it in Jesus' capable and faithful name.